Hello and welcome to Press TV's uh, World News Analysis, coming to you from uh, Tehran. Thanks so much for being with us. I'm Marzi Hashimi. Well, Syria has buried many victims of the terrorist bomb attacks, which took place in Damascus, killing and wounding many civilians. Now, as the pressure continues on Damascus, many Syrians have once again held demonstrations condemning what they call foreign interference in their country. Syrian opposition groups say that the government in Damascus is responsible for the violence due to its crackdown. Well, stay with us. We will be taking a look at the latest from Syria and what may lie ahead. The ruling party says the Damascus attacks are an Israeli-American plot aimed at destroying the Syrian establishment. It's also aimed at undermining Syria's national unity and the people's confidence in the leadership. The party says Friday's attacks are the latest in the crimes of terrorists who are funded and armed by forces from abroad. But Syrians won't be terrorized by such crimes. The only reason to have such problem uh, in Syria and these declarations and statements from Syria accusing Israel and the United States uh, I guess are uh, true in most of them. The only way to do this uh, instability in Syria by uh, making these explosions, uh, especially in Damascus, since Damascus did not uh, move or did not uh, uh, did not uh, go uh, behind these people who are in Dara or in Talqalaq or uh, some groups even in Turkey. On Saturday, thousands of people held funeral procession for the victims of the twin explosions that targeted security and intelligence bases. Syrians on Friday also held nationwide rallies condemning the attacks and calling for national unity. The explosions have rocked Damascus as an Arab League team is in Syria. The United Nations says thousands of people have lost their lives in the months of unrest in Syria. Damascus says more than 2,000 members of the national army and security personnel are among the dead. The opposition holds the government responsible for the violence, but Damascus blames foreign-backed armed gangs. Well, I'd like to welcome my guest to the program uh, from Beirut, professor at Lebanese at University, Mr. Abraham Musavi. From Damascus, political analyst Wal al-Imam, and from London, Hello. Middle East Affairs expert, Mr. Zaid al Isa. Welcome, all of you, to the program. We appreciate you coming on. I'd like to start off in, uh, in Beirut. Uh, so, Professor Musavi, who do you think is basically more likely to be behind the bombings in Damascus? Well, first, we have to see what, what are the things that are taking place now in Syria. It has been now more than like 10 months that the continuous pressure is mounting against Syria. They are trying to blackmail uh, the government there and the president. They want them to bow to the American pressures. They have been building a siege against Syria. They wanted to internationalize the crisis and to try to bring the international community and the Security Council. They wanted to enact sanctions against the government and the people as well. They have started to make a kind of regional build-up by the Arab uh, League and uh, by the Turks as well. The European Union and many of the European countries have started to use heated debates and heated statements against Syria, its president. And the, in the meantime, we've been able to see that armed groups inside Syria, they have been targeting the armed forces, they have been targeting the civilians, they have been uh, trying to cut off the different parts and regions in Syria from one another. And the Syrian army has been able uh, delicately to engage with all of these problems and to maintain a certain level of stability that is acceptable and understandable. Now, after all of this time, they have grown uh, very angry and uh, the despair has uh, penetrated their hearts that they are not going uh, or they are not going to be able to achieve any of the goals or the agenda they have put already. Uh, they know very well that it would be very difficult for them to see the American troops uh, leaving Iraq under the strikes of the Iraqi resistance. The Iraq is growing to be a kind of independent pole, regional pole, where it has a certain good relations with Iran. Not being dictated or not having this harmony with the uh, Arab uh, Gulf, uh, with the Gulf, uh, Gulf countries, because uh, the Gulf countries are being dictated uh, by the United States policy. So the only thing that they resorted for, they wanted to say 
that the Syrian army, the Syrian uh, uh, military cannot control, is not taking or is not having a uh, uh, tight grip over the Syrian capital, they made these kind of explosions because they wanted to uh, exert, exert and exercise more pressure on the Syrian and to tell uh, the Syrians that you have to bow down to the, uh, to the pressures by the, uh, by the Arab League and by the regional community, let alone by the international community. Okay. What I can simply say here, what I can say simply here, this is a kind of political bankruptcy. We have seen that the uh, Turks have built up their statements. We have seen the Qataris have done the same thing. But now they have all withdrawn from the scene, and we have been able to see the Egyptian and the Iraqi coming with this uh, uh, mediation. So I believe this is not something that is going to uh, make the Syrian grow despaired from what's really happening. They are not going to be disappointed. This is going to unite the people more and more behind their leadership. And we know very well, we're not talking here about uh, a complete or idealistic uh, democracy. We're not saying that the people do not have their own demands and that should be met uh, in a very democratic way. But we have all seen at the same time that the Syrian leadership has ushered in a new era of reforms in the political level and in the social level. But uh, uh, alas, and what a pity, the international community does not want that to take place. Okay. They want the uh, regime to be toppled simply because they are afraid of the new axis that is gaining momentum. This is the axis of the resistance and the axis uh, of steadfastness against the American project, especially after the humiliating withdrawal of the Americans from Iraq. Okay, well, let me turn to Damascus and uh, get Mr. Al Imam in on this. Uh, your take on this, sir, with the situation now with the latest bombings, do you think it is likely to actually uh, cause the Syrian people to unite together more against uh, what is deemed to be uh, external hands? Or how do you see the current status inside of your country? I think the question is why these two huge terroristic explosions are now. Because Syria faced some small explosions in some uh, cities like Homos and Idlib. So the, now, but these two huge uh, terroristic explosions we faced at now during this conspiracy against Syria, Syria, we faced it now in Damascus, because before in the 90s of this uh, of the last century, we faced like that uh, from the Ikhwan al-Muslimin, the the, the uh, brothers Muslims. Now. We, we, we will face uh, such as uh, huge terroristic explosions. I think because the first stage and the second stage of this conspiracy are failed. The first stage uh, seeked to use the manifestations to inverse the Syrian authority. The second stage is to uh, seek to implement what's called the free army, which is formed by the terrorist and the criminal people in Syria. Now we enter the third stage of this conspiracy. This stage, which contains some terroristic explosions and assassinations and hostages keeping, this Two explosions seek to implement a chaotic situation in Damascus in order to stop the normal lifestyle in Damascus and to make Syrian citizens uh, terrorized. The quality of these two explosions, I think, uh, will, uh, will drive the government and the investigations to Al-Qaeda organization. And in the last, uh, in the last uh, three months, the Al-Qaeda has a legal installation in Qatar. And there is a negotiation between Al-Qaeda and the Americans. And these informations to be sure for us, there is a negotiation in the mediation by Qatar. Now the question, what kind of, what kind of uh, a deal 
what kind of a deal between the Americans and the Al-Qaeda. And I will ask the question if the Al-Qaeda now and the Al-Jihad of Qaeda will be in Syria and not in Palestine. So the idea we face now uh, a, a extremism, uh, Islamic ex extremism uh, represented by represented by Al-Qaeda and some people of the Syrian uh, Syrian people who has the same thinking of this organization like Al-Qaeda. Okay, well let me, turn, let me turn to London and get Mr. Zaid al-Issa in on this discussion. What's your take, uh, Mr. al-Issa, which entity, uh, which group benefits from what is going on, this lack of stability uh, that, uh, for example, with the bombs, uh, with the bombing and so many people being killed. So, in your perspective, who is behind all of this? Well, uh, we have first uh, to acknowledge that the situation is highly volatile and highly, pro uh, highly precarious, particularly with the intervention of Al-Qaeda. And we've seen those uh, bombings come just one day, hot on the heels of a series of bombings that also have rocked uh, Baghdad, where the purpose there was to reintroduce and give the American forces the justification and the reasoning to actually re Iraq under the pretext that the current government in, the, in Iraq and the current security for, forces are totally incapable of maintaining or holding uh, law and order. We, we see that the same situation is actually uh, happening in Syria. There is uh, an intention to severely destabilize and derail any intention towards genuine and real dialogue between the peaceful uh, protesters or the peaceful opposition with the government to uh, hammer out a compromise or to reach a deal to stabilize the situation and to prevent any further bloodshed. Uh, let me be absolutely clear. Violence against uh, uh, protesters, peaceful protesters, are totally unacceptable. But uh, on the other hand, it must be acknowledged by the Arab League and also by the international community that there are uh, people out there, there are organizations who are heavily armed and they are increasingly getting more uh, ammunition and more sophisticated armory which are uh, taking out and carrying out uh, attacks against uh, government installations and also against army barracks and they Mr. are Issa, fighting against the Let me jump in here. You, you just made, let me jump in, in here. You made a couple of points just now that you said the international community and the Arab League should at, at acknowledge that uh, at the same time there have been some um, uh, protesters, innocent protesters killed, but also that uh, there are outside entities that are getting arms inside of the country and behind a lot of this violence. Why do you think that that has not been acknowledged by uh, the majority of the Western community and also the Arab League? Well, uh, I do believe that the process they're going through is similar to what we call the Benghazi model. What the, what the intention is, uh, clearly, is to apply that model because the Iraqi model is completely and totally out of question. It has failed miserably. The Americans do need the backing of the United Nations. They do need the endorsement of the United Nations. That's why they have been exerting intense and, uh, and relentless pressure on the Russians and the Chinese to actually give way and give their endorsement to United, United Nations resolutions okay. which firstly impose sweeping sanctions which ultimately would hurt as we know from the experience of in Iraq ultimately would hurt the people of Syria but the intention as the Russians say is ultimately regime change that's okay. what they uh, are let, after let me stop and they you want on to that. get no, the let me get professor Musavi back in on this uh, with uh, what uh, our, our guest in London has just um, talked about uh, Mr. El Issa and uh, the UN, the UN Security Council. Let's look at it. Do you think that the situation in Syria, what is taking place, could also possibly lead to a schism of the permanent members there? Because we know that the Chinese and also the Russians are not exactly on the same page that Washington and London would like them to be. How do you see that uh, aspect of all of this playing itself out? 
Well, I believe that every member of the international community, and here I want to give another terminology or revisit the definition that we see. When they talk about the international community, I just want to shed light and highlight, for example, the BRICS. This is the group of uh, five countries, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, uh, China, and South Africa. They mount for more than half of the population of our planet. And uh, most of the people and most of the politicians and the diplomats, they refer to the international community thinking that the, what makes the international community is only France, Britain, and uh, the United States of America. Uh, they all cannot mount to the number of the people who are in China itself. So the BRICS, these five uh, members uh, of this bloc, they have, agreed, they have agreed that they don't want to see the scenario of Benghazi being replayed again in Syria. This is one thing. They have been able to understand the American policy and the American attempts to spread its hegemony in the economic level and in the military level. That's why, I mean, the Russians, yes, they have been pressuring for some extent. They wanted the Syrians to accept in any way the, uh, the Arab, uh, and they have advised the Arab League initiative. And the Syrians, actually, they were trying from the very beginning to cooperate. They had their own kind of amendments and uh, changes for certain, or, um, for certain elements of the protocol that would endanger or would violate the Syrian sovereignty. When they were met, they accepted to sign the protocol, and we have seen this. I believe that the international community, and when I say the international community here, I don't mean Britain, France, and uh, the United States. I mean also the other important... Uh, 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 countries like China, like Russia, like, like India, like Brazil, like South Africa, and other countries, they will not accept that the uh, United Nations be dictated solely by the United States of America, by Britain, and by France, because they are following their own agenda. We are only witnessing another chapter in the history of this region. We've been able to see the European and the American expansionism at one time. Now it's more or less a kind of economic and a kind of uh, expansionism, expansionism that would divide the country into different entities so it would be easy for them to rule or even to have the superpower or the upper hand over all the situation that might prevail later on, especially under the uh, Arab Spring and the revolutions that we are witnessing in different parts of the region. Now, Mr. Al-Imam, how concerned are you at this point of uh, a direct military intervention from especially uh, with the support of some of these Western countries and uh, Arab countries, for that matter? I think it's a good question because the Syrian citizens don't accept the Iraqi and Libyan scenarios imposed by the Arab League and the international community and refuse any external intervention in Syria. This is the first idea. On the internal side, we refuse to using, to using the terrorism against the civilians in Syria and in the cities of Syria to arrive to some uh, political objectives from the other people who tries to have a chaotic situation in Syria. This is, we refuse that. And the Syrian citizens are very aware about this uh, cons uh, conspiracy against Syria, not only against the authority in Syria, but at the same time against the Syrian citizens themselves. So any, inter, any, uh, any intervention, external intervention uh, from NATO and from, the, uh, and from the other countries, the Syrian citizens refuse that definitely uh, and they don't accept any intervention in Syria. Okay, well, Mr. al Issa, your take on that. Do you think that we will be witnessing a more direct intervention by some of these Western countries? We look and we, we see the rhetoric coming out of Washington, what's coming out of London, and it seems that as the days progress, they become more and more condemning of the government in Damascus. How do you see this playing itself out? 
I think their overarching goal is definitely moving towards a regime change. That's what they're after. They are trying to topple the regime, but they're trying to do it on the cheap. And when I say on the cheap, they are trying to actually help the opposition inside Syria and what's uh, the, uh, what, uh, the so-called uh, Syrian Free Army to actually uh, bolster support to it, to, in, to enable it to take on the military and to actually encourage further military defections and they are after huge defections. What I, what I do believe is, uh, is the things that they have failed so far to do in order to implement the Benghazi scenario is they need a city. They need the city to slip out of the control of the government, to be totally in the control of the, uh, let's say, armed opposition. And they need massive defections from the army. And they also need defections from highly influential and highly senior officials who actually defy the regime and ask for regime change. Exactly the same. And on top of that, they need an Arab League to actually call and plead with the international community and the UN to interfere and to send and to establish a no-fly zone. As I said, there are no troops on the ground. That has been established. That has been a complete fiasco in Iraq. They will never repeat it again and they will never go without a UN resolution backing them. Now, the Russians are accusing and we, we can still hear it in the United Nations reverberating. There are accusations and they want an investigation into what happened in Libya. And they are being steadfastly determined to actually not uh, allow the Americans to repeat what happened or the NATO, what happened in Libya by saying uh, outrightly that you have overstepped the authority and the powers given to you by the resolution 1973. Okay. These are the requirements on the ground for them to actually move from sanctions. They need the Arab League, they need the Arab world and I do believe that the major force which is pushing for regime change in Syria, in Syria is actually Saudi Arabia, which is the bastion and the, uh, the bastion of dictatorship in the Middle East. And it is uh, mainly the driving force which wants to see the regime change. And that's why it's trying to instigate, encourage and form an and form a sectarian divide, and that is the weapon it always uses. Let's not forget that our Al-Qaeda adheres and adopts the same ideology, which is the Wahhabi Salafi ideology, propagated and propped up by the religious institution, which is heavily backed by the, the regime in Saudi Arabia. Okay, and now, on that note, Mr. Zaid al Isa, I am so sorry. I am so sorry to interrupt you, but we are out of time. I thank you, Middle East experts, uh, from London, Mr. Zaid Al-Isa, Professor Lebanese University, uh, Mr. Abraham Musavi from Beirut, and from Damascus, political analyst, Mr. Wail Al-Imam. Thank you all for being with us. And always, viewers, we appreciate you being with us. Join us here, same time, same place, as we take a look at another a look at uh, one of tomorrow's top stories. I'm Marzi Hashimi signing out for myself and all the crew here in Tehran. Thank you so much, and goodbye.